very large number of participants, and so we will not waste time. And I'll ask, uh, ask uh, my co-host, uh, I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm Barger Mehta from the World Bank, uh, and my co-host, uh, she will host uh, most of the work of the session, and that's uh, uh, Lauren, so Lauren, please. <laughs> Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, everyone. I'm Lauren Sorkin from the Resilient Cities Network, and welcome, as always, to Cities on the Front Line. Um, tonight, we do have, as Barjor mentioned, uh, a very full panel and a very exciting topic around private sector engagement in urban resilience. And tonight, we're really going to be diving into how can local businesses collaborate to improve their own resilience and the resilience of the communities in which they work. So um, as we dive in, I will just remind everyone of the ground rules for tonight's presentation. This presentation is a pre presentation for practitioners. It is not on the record, but if you are a journalist and you are listening in or listening to the recording and you do want to publish something you've heard, please do get in touch with us. We will put you in touch with the speakers um, so that you can publish about this work if they are willing. I would also remind everyone that we will make all of the presentations and materials available after this session on our website, as well as a full video of the session. Because of the large number of participants tonight, we will be putting all of the Q&A in through the chat function, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. So please go ahead and put your questions into the chat as we go along tonight. So back to the content. Um, as COVID-19 has shown us that some businesses are able to respond and can actually become crucial in a community or region or even a nation's resilience. And so businesses can develop their own plans for disaster risk management in-house, but also as part of a community. So we're going to dive in tonight to talk about resilient businesses, building networks of resilient businesses as well. Um, and so in this session, we have a number of speakers who are going to highlight the role that networks and businesses can play in building resilient communities. We know that government simply cannot do this alone and cannot do many of the functions that normal businesses do as part of those as part of their own activities, whether that's selling pumps, generators, environmental sensors, many other kinds of services. And if we are looking at building back better, we can have a better conversation about how business becomes part of the resilience story. So I am going to introduce our first speaker tonight, Hans-Peter Teufers, and he is the Director of International Programs at the UPS Foundation. And he is responsible for international humanitarian programs of the foundation and works with many of the humanitarian partners of the foundation in Europe and in Asia to deliver critical services in humanitarian situations. So we know that Hans-Peter, you've been very, very busy over the last two years. Um, He's going to share with us how the foundation's priorities and efforts are building capacity and projects about preparedness and resilience in the business community and how that can benefit the public. So without further ado, Hans-Peter, I am turning the screen and the microphone over to you. Thanks a lot. Let me try to use my technical skills. Yeah, it works, it seems. So what I would like to talk about, uh, Lauren, and um, to, the, to the audience, and I hope we have many people that are listening uh, today, uh, is about partnerships and collaboration, about focus, focusing, focused work, and about standardization. So those are the three main aspects. And in this uh, Cities on the Frontline uh, webinar, where the private sector role should be explored a bit deeper, um, we have as well a number of very, let's say, deep dives into practical aspects in different countries. Let me focus a little bit on the on the basic idea on how, how we came into business resilience. So um, briefly, what the UPS Foundation is doing. Oops, here we go. Yes, um, we are 
um, we are delivering um, most help needed um, country. We are delivering to most help needed countries, and um, we see some figures. I don't want to dive too deep into that. We have about 120 million philanthropic contributions through different ways, um, using volunteering hours a lot, and working with a number of different organizations around the globe in about 127, 170 countries. So um, the four focus groups that we are having at you, um, we will try to find out where resilience is based here. So we have health and humanitarian relief. All, um, all is connected under the big uh, word or abbreviation, HELP, H-E-L-P, health and humanitarian relief, equity and economic empowerment, local community engagement and planet protection. Basically, resilience is a little bit in there in 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 most of it because we have uh, we have we we started to work on the resilience many years ago, focusing on um, small and medium sized enterprise, and so therefore we have a little bit in the health and humanitarian relief section, we have a little bit in economic empowerment, and then of course in local and community engagement, and um, so the three main things I want to talk about. Um, uh, today uh, is on one end how we are using our contributions and our work in partnerships and in collaboration. So, uh, first of all, there is of course this partnership we are talking about today with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation, uh, with WEF, and then with local partners like IDEMA, um, like like uh, the Asia Foundation to drive local programs on resilience. But we have as well. Uh, partnered with other organizations in in uh, in groups like CBI Connecting Business Initiatives, where we have been one of the founding members in 2016 uh, at the Istanbul Summit. Um, we are engaged in Arise as well, with this, with, with which is the with, which is UNDRR's private sector activity related to resilience. And last but not least, uh, we are engaging in GEA, the Global Humanitarian. Action Executive Alliance, where there are a number of big companies that are trying to work together to cooperate on different work streams. Now, the focus that we have taken uh, on is on SMBs because we wanted to have tangible outcomes when we are talking about resilience. We do not want to save the world uh, a little bit here and a little bit there. So we wanted to focus to have a real impact in that regard. And it should be a part of a business decision as well. So it is a natural aspect that we are focusing on one of our biggest clients groups, which, which is uh, small and medium sized enterprises. And last but not least, we wanted to have a type of a standardized approach, a generic approach that is um, um, that is resilience in the box. And we are trying to use on one hand the networks and as well our own organization to disseminate uh, the ideas. Let me, let me briefly give you uh, an understanding uh, uh, where that came from. Um, okay, so this is not working, but this is working. Um, I think I do not need to dive very deep into that. You see the pictures and you have seen many, many of these pictures in the past uh, with additional themes like fire, like storms, like water coming from the ocean and so forth and so forth. So, I mean, it's pretty clear that um, our level of um, um, of, uh, of these assets is rising. On one hand, on the other side, our level of resilience should rise at least in the same way, if not more. The big thing here is uh, usually, especially in, in, in within with small and medium sized um, um, businesses, resilience is not incorporated, even though resilience and risk management has um, a very um, relevant aspect in all big corporations. So I can remember that UPS starting uh, started al already in the first 10 years of the 2000s in doing risk management very heavily in uh, going through meetings and meetings and meetings and talking about the risks that that are potentially um, relevant for continuing the business. Business continuity is one of the aspects that is playing a big role. But um, business continuity is an aspect that is as well costing money and resources. That's a bit of a problem. So now. What we what we try to do uh, is to raise attention to the aspect of resilience with the program, and you will hear more about that when when um, when my friends from Turkey and from uh, from Vietnam uh, will will tell you a little bit about how we are trying to do that. 
uh, getting businesses connected, taking their own responsibility and trying to do something at least. So on one hand, um, there was a progression in, 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 our, in our way uh, related to resilience. And um, so we, on one hand, try to prioritize, prioritize countries with a high, high hazard risk. Um, on one hand, on the other side, um, we then try to launch partnerships in those countries, like in Turkey, with our with our program, uh, um, um, uh, The program at some point should be sustainable, innovative, and then beneficial um, um, as 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 well, uh, in order to increase the the community's ability to uh, expedite recovery, reduce losses and injuries when the disaster strikes. Um, we figured that. Um, after we came up with resilience in the box as a generic tool, um, that doing trainings is not enough. You simply don't reach the critical mass if you only train. So you need partners, you need others that are as well picking up uh, that challenge and trying to go into that. So we, we asked ourselves at some point of that journey, uh, what is success? So, and I will give you one example. If you have an economy with 1.5 million, um, um, small and medium sized enterprises, and it's easy. You find you, SMEs, SMBs are uh, making probably something between 90 and 98 percent of, of the companies in each and every economy around the globe. Now, if you start training them one by one, trying to do it hands on, you probably get maybe 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000. But what is 5,000 compared to 1.5 million? It's in the per mil range somewhere. It's, it's even not visible. So therefore, it's much more relevant to take other initiatives to make sure that you are rise, raising awareness massively. And that is where we started using electronic media very, very, very much in the past years. Um, and then when we tried to replicate as well, what we learned, the learnings we took, we tried from, uh, we tried from, uh, from Turkey, from Mexico, from other countries, and that brought that back in, into, the, into our uh, generic program. Now, the program itself is um, targeting unprepared businesses, and there are a lot, I can tell you. Three levels, basic, intermediate, advanced. And what we really wanted to, to do is to build on, um, uh, on awareness building. We thought that at some point, if you're going into business continuity plans, and a lot of the states are unfamiliar with do have uh, a type of a regulation that says you need to have something like a business continuity plan, at least something comparable to that, uh, or emergency plan, and people don't have it. So, so um, it's it's not about fulfilling uh, fulfilling um, regulatory rules. It is about making sure that as a business you are taking responsibility and you start thinking about what happens uh, when you probably um, miss something. And uh, seeing, you know, seeing best practices helps always. And um, if the partner you are working with is doing something and you're not doing it, you start questioning yourself why you're not doing that. It's the same thing as uh, when somebody has a golden watch and you do not, do not have a golden watch. So you have to bring it into that perspective, making a part of a business decision. And each, each, each level builds on the previous level. And at some point, if you need to get into a, a more advanced status, then you have to probably look for an advisor and pay for it. Now, uh, at the end of the day, uh, those are the areas that the that the best practice solutions uh, and as well our programs are focusing on operations, inventory, equipment, buildings, people, data, um, and there can be more. Those are only the six critical business assets. And to close with one thing, with two with two figures, it is said that one one dollar invested into resilience saves maybe five to seven dollars. Uh, relief and recovery. That's something um, I, I, I well remembered all the time when I was working in there. And the other thing is um, the 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 2080 principle. If you if you do if you only do let's say a little bit, you might already cover 80 uh, percent of the risks that you are having. Um, and at the end of the day, you have much more time and can spend more efforts on the rest that is more complicated. Therefore, we tried to focus on awareness. Having said that, I thanks for, thank you for your attention and for your patience. Um, you see two links down there that you can use if you want to learn more about the UPS Foundation. That's my email address if you want to ask me something after the seminar. And I'm handing it back to Lauren for the next speaker.
Thank you, Hans Peter, for the both very broad and ambitious presentation as well as the specifics. I'm sure we're going to have some questions about that and how um, you're going into these different environments and um, and both quantifying resilience and building on that stepwise process. I think to bring us even closer to the ground and some of the programs that you've been supporting, we have two speakers who are joining us next. We have Evren Audegon, and he has been with IDEMA as the Deputy General Manager for three years, previously working with various think tanks and in the private sector as a researcher, senior expert, project manager, and a government regulations affairs manager, and is currently pursuing his PhD. He is also joined by a colleague, Berfu Kopur, who is a senior project specialist at IDEMA and has also previously worked in the private sector um, in project management roles as well as in nonprofit. And so I am going to present uh, them with the microphone and the screen here, and they are going to take us through the Kobe project. So, uh, Evren and Berfu, over to you. Thank you, Lauren. Um, uh, hello, everyone. I'll be just very briefly make an introduction of our, like who we are and like what kind of we are coordinating. Uh, actually, uh, thank you, Lauren, for the introduction. And uh, I would like to like, start by thanking the UPS and like particularly UPS Foundation. Uh, by supporting us for more than eight years to be like to make us more resilient in terms of helping the small and medium businesses more resilient. So that 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 partnership changed a lot in Turkish uh, business resilience landscape, and we are uh, we are seeing the impacts of it right now, uh, especially and unfortunately that we are right now dealing with massive. Uh, um, uh, massive disasters in Turkey. The fires, uh, just yesterday, the fires stopped, but at the same day, a big flood happened. Right now, some of our team uh, members are in the in the northern part of Turkey. The fires were the very were in the very south of Turkey, but now in the very very north of Turkey, we are now dealing with the flood. So, like it, in each and every very sad disasters, we are seeing how crucial the project that we are condu conducting with UPS Foundation and other partners, US Chamber of Commerce and others, is crucial to have business continuity, resilient business, and a more brighter future, if you like, in terms of not only economy, but also environment, and in terms of all social dynamics. So uh, maybe we can start with the presentation after this introduction. We, as IDEMA, uh, we are kind of uh, operating as a for 10 years a hub for development practitioners. Uh, we are conducting tons of different types of socioeconomic projects, which is starting from the integration of the refugees and social and economic integration to GIS uh, solutions to social solidarity uh, from disaster resilience to business resilience and some other novel if you like corporate social responsibility projects to solve some local problems within Turkey. That's why we do have a lot uh, local, um, uh, if you like, local offices around Turkey. And now with this Alam Kobi project that Berfu will mention, we are like establishing center of excellences under the roof of the local chamber of commerce to have uh, to have like more local resilience capacity within the local uh, local institution. So what we are doing here in, in Edema is try to create a local, national and global real impact, meaningful impact when it comes to social, social economic development and resilient societies, cities and businesses. So in that manner, our project Salam Kobi is one of the pioneers uh, of our impacts. Maybe we can start with the Salam Kobi presentation. Uh, Barfu will uh, will be giving the details to all of you, uh, but I would like to say that that's that's like as I said, as you can see, uh, in the very first place, like UPS Foundation, US Chamber of Commerce, and World Economic Forum uh, were with us, and now we do have like lot of different organizations for supporting Salam Kobi, uh, from Google to Allianz to Esri to Youth Business International, Turkish uh, National. 
um, Union of Commodity Exchange of Chambers and, and, and some others as well. So Salam Kobi is right now a platform rather than a project for business resilience and continuity, which composes of the four main components business um, uh, economic resilience social resilience disaster resilience and digital resilience and Balfour will give you the details what are we doing right now on the field as Hans Peter very nice to put not only the trainings but also our field field implications and then she will be giving a very bit of what is our future ambitions if you like future endeavors to make Salam Kobe global rather than a local and national uh, solution to disaster problems that our businesses are uh, facing. Thank you. Yes, uh, okay. thank you everyone for summarizing where we're coming from. Uh, I will try to explain a bit more about how we function on a day to day basis and what we offer as a uh, disaster resiliency uh, platform, as we call it. Uh, especially starting from this year and onwards. So basically, Salam Kobi project has been established in uh, 2013 uh, after a massive earthquake uh, that took place in the eastern uh, province of Turkey. So what we uh, offer uh, in the first place is a self-assessment toolkit for SMEs in order to improve their business resiliency. Uh, including uh, four main stages. The first stage is the business prepared, uh, preparedness quiz, where SMEs can, upon registering to our website, could take a test to uh, pinpoint where uh, the uh, issue areas that they are lacking and uh, they're successing by far uh, to uh, build resilient uh, businesses. Uh, the second stage is uh, top 20 tips uh, where they can find uh, the main um, resources and insights uh, about building a resilient uh, business. And the uh, third resource uh, is uh, Workbook 101, where they can uh, check for the additional uh, information uh, to improve their resiliency. And in the last uh, stage, uh, we offer the, the Disaster Resistant uh, Business Toolkit which is the main object uh, of uh, all the self-assessment uh, toolkit. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, starting from this year, we have switched our focus to a more innovative um, action plan uh, to include uh, diverse uh, business environments and uh, stakeholders uh, in to uh, build uh, sustainable communities local, uh, national, and global uh, resilient communities. Uh, and as the first step of this uh, vision, uh, with the support from uh, Google.org and Youth Business International from uh, the UK, we in initiated uh, the digitalization and disaster resilience program for SMEs, uh, which we, uh, in which we offered uh, digitalization and digital marketing training programs for SMEs to also include digital resiliency into business resiliency as a main component, uh, especially after uh, the COVID, uh, which um, most of us uh, have started working on a remote basis through online uh, tools. So we adapted digitalization components to Salam Kobe. Uh, Within our uh, Salam Kobi 2.0 vision, we also uh, started utilizing um, GIS based mapping solutions in order to illustrate uh, the supply chain uh, within a, a particular region in order to make them, uh, in order to help them after the disasters uh, to see uh, their supply, cha uh, supply chains uh, on a um, easier uh, to help support with better efficiency. Uh, moving on. Uh, also, everyone mentioned uh, a bit about the Centers of Excellence initiative that were uh, started this year as well. Uh, so we have partnered with TOP, which is the highest ranking um, entity representing the private sector in Turkey. 
Uh, and as a pilot study, we partnered with 20 uh, local chambers to transfer our know-how uh, on a local scale for them to help support local SMEs. Uh, and this step has uh, particularly enabled our impact sphere to go wider uh, through Turkey. Uh, and maybe we can close a bit more about talking uh, about our future vision. Uh, with the Salam Kobi 2.0 vision, we adopted a, a, a holistic approach to build resilient businesses across Turkey and, uh, and the world. So we have uh, four main components, uh, disaster resiliency, disaster and emergency resiliency, digital resilience, social resilience, and economic resilience. Uh, and uh, within this vision, uh, we also try to um, include some innovative ways to sustain our efforts in a more effective way. Uh, and the first uh, component of it is including uh, creating a curricula for vocational ed education high schools and a gamification feature to address uh, address uh, young entrepreneurs and uh, business owners about business uh, resiliency. The second, uh, uh, let's say, dream of ours is building a social marketplace where all, S all SMEs and their supply chain uh, actors and uh, related stakeholders can see uh, and communicate with each other in order to uh, take more efficient uh, disaster recovery responses after uh, an emergency situation. Uh, and last but not least, we would like to integrate a fintech solution to our uh, MAP uh, platform in order to facilitate easier payment uh, checkout systems. Uh, and that would be uh, all from us today. Thank you for your time. If you uh, contact with us, these are our social media and uh, email addresses. And you can also uh, email to me or Evran for further clarifications or questions. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Evran. Thank you so much, uh, Berfu for explaining the program to us. It's, it's really incredibly uh, accessible um, and, and in depth. And I'm sure that we're going to discuss that more during the Q and A. Um, we're, we are now moving from Turkey to another country entirely, to a country that's uh, very near and dear to my heart to Vietnam, where I used to live. And the first speaker uh, is someone that I had the pleasure of working with when I was in Vietnam. So let me introduce him to all of you. Um, Dr. Michael D. Gregorio. He is the leader of the Asia Foundation in Vietnam, the country representative, and he has been directing the foundation's work since 2014 and has been leading a number of new projects and programs to address business-related disaster risk, has been leading projects on city-level climate resilience, um, and previously, he was also serving as a researcher for the Rockefeller Foundation's Asian Cities Climate Change Resilient Network, which really helped build the base for what is now today the, the Resilient Cities Network. Um, he also holds a doctorate in urban planning as well as a master's in Southeast Asian Studies. So he's no stranger to uh, city resilience, to urban resilience. Michael, let me turn the screen and the microphone over to you. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah, um, um, I think we're all aware of the critical situations we're facing. Um, you know, the IPCC report came out earlier this week and offered a very stark vision of the future in which uh, fires, floods, and extreme weather seen around the world uh, in recent months are just a foretaste of what can be expected as ecosystems collapse. Um, but uh, as anybody who works on resilience knows, um, the vulnerabilities extend beyond what we perceive as climate-related risks. In, in fact, our entire, you know, modern economic system is a vulnerability. If you just think about how much money you carry in your wallet or your pocketbook and how much you rely on electronic and digital banking all the time, uh, you can understand how just something like a, a failure in the 
electronic banking system is a major vulnerability we all face. Um, you know, you've heard you've heard from Hans Peter and Evran and Berfu, um, and I, I I think the sum of what we've been saying uh, is in this sentence: um, building networks of resilient businesses to advocate for their own needs and the needs of their communities creates a resource that cities need in times of crisis. Um, I, I think you've heard from others, and but I will kind of summarize here how the COVID epidemic really emphasized that point. Uh, if you just think about some of the things that were required to, to just start, uh, I can't say our normal lives functioning, but let's say, say a, a kind of life functioning for the past 20 months or so. Um, for example, we needed private businesses to uh, reestablish supply chains. In Hans Peter's own work, for example, you know the the international trade in in fruits and vegetables and fresh fish and things like that, they rely on passenger jet a lot of their cargo, and you know the 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 um, the, the international uh, cargo um, so, uh, services had to quickly shift over to cargo planes when those passenger planes were no longer flying because of uh, with closed borders. And that happened in Vietnam in particular. Um, but then there's things like the personal protective equipment and medical equipment that had to be supplied and, and, and production needed to be ramped up very quickly. And as I mentioned, we all rely on digital banking, commerce and communications for just about everything that we do. And when we're all working from home, I mean, those things became crucial to all of us, including things like delivery services. And we needed those internet service providers to keep that stuff functioning. But, you know, you can go far beyond this as well into things like uh, weather services. There are lots of uh, small uh, proprietary subscription weather services that provide information to farmers, for example. And then there are environmental sensors and mobile apps that are used in, in farming and in fish farming and, and in monitoring things like salinization of tidal rivers uh, and renewable energy, of course, and then disaster response products and services uh, and, and insurance providers. I mean, this is a short list, but uh, you can see where I'm going with this, that we really do rely on businesses for a lot of the services during times of crisis. Um, we, as the Asia Foundation, we didn't come to this awareness suddenly. Um, we've been working in these areas for at least 10 years, close to 12 years. Uh, I myself, I is Robin, uh, as Lauren mentioned, I've been working for the Rockefeller Foundation uh, under the Asian, uh, Asian Cities Climate Resil Cities Re Resilience Network, um, doing research on, uh, on uh, flooding and extreme events in Vietnam and uh, uh, relationship to urban planning. But the Asia Foundation, since 2011, uh, began work on an uh, Office of uh, uh, foreign disaster assistance and USAID project on disaster risk reduction for businesses. Now that project, um, we did exactly what Hans Peter said we shouldn't do. We we did establish a, a website with the tra with the curriculum on it, but our major focus was in direct training of uh, of businesses. And uh, over seven years, we trained about two thousand seven hundred. Uh, staff of businesses or about 3,000 people in 21 provinces in Vietnam. Um, and we also did quite a bit of research on things like insurance and banking uh, and, and their role in disaster risk reduction. But for the past couple of years, we've been working with the UPS Foundation, uh, trying to establish um, a by business for business network uh, for disaster risk reduction and uh, climate change uh, awareness and preparedness. 
now there's a, a few things that we've learned through this process and, and I'm going to go through them here. Um, I just want to say that you, the image you're looking at on the left is a company in Vietnam that is uh, actually uh, working as one of the uh, steering committee members for the Mekong Business Resilience Network. And uh, what you're seeing is the readout for salinity meter for shrimp ponds. And uh, I don't know if everyone knows this, but you know the shrimp ponds are located near the coast, and um, but the salinity level has to be uh, maintained at a uh, a level between the salt and fresh water. Um, and if you have a high evaporation rate during a drought, you have to pump fresh water in. And especially during a drought, the shrimp farmers have to know very accurately what their um, salinity level is so they can turn those pumps on and off. And uh, many of them are living in areas where they have poor or no electricity. So that's quite a costly operation and they don't want to do it haphazardly because uh, they have to use diesel pumps uh, to do so. So this kind of application really gives them real-time information to prevent the loss of their shrimp during a, a disaster like a long drought. So back to, uh, back to my uh, presentation here. Um, so one of the things that we found was that you know, very often the business resilience frameworks uh, focus on assessment of vulnerabilities, uh, preparation and recovery of core business operations following a disaster. Um, that includes, uh, you know, the things that Hans Peter mentioned at the beginning, the physical sites, materials, equipment, business infrastructure, like data systems and communication, and of course, employees, those are their first concerns. They're not thinking about city resilience at this point. They're thinking about the resilience of their own business and, uh, and preparation for, for uh, disaster and getting their employees back to work. Um, beyond the work site, however, you know, businesses face complex globally connected supply chains and distribution networks that are well-known business, business vulnerabilities. Uh, one of the effects of uh, COVID is it really emphasized that vulnerability in ways that you know, people were aware of before, but they you know, always assumed that there was a solution. You know, from, from some of our research in Vietnam, some of the globally connected uh, companies um, they told us, well, we have no problem with that because we always can shift our supply chain from Southeast Asia to South America or something like that. Well, that doesn't work in a global pandemic. And so now a, a, a lot of supply chains have been shifting from just in time to just in case, especially for critical inventory. Um, but, you know, businesses also suffer from the burden of inappropriate urban planning and construction. Uh, in this case, you know, businesses can be both the victims and the perpetrators, especially, you know, I think uh, most of us were, you know, know of real estate and uh, urban development projects that are located in the wrong places, like in the middle of a urban uh, floodplain along a river or something like that, that just exacerbates the flood hazard or construction projects like roads across floodplains that um, actually create barriers and, and increase flooding. Uh, or, you know, just, you know, poor agroforestry practices that create, make hillsides vulnerable to, to landslide. Um, uh, uh, fourth, uh, um, you know, while many businesses are impacted by disasters, others can provide the products and services to reduce impacts on other businesses and their community. Now, we've already mentioned some of these, and I think I'll show you a slide on the next one. Um, and finally, businesses, business associations can also contribute to their communities through research. Um, this is not always something that is obvious to, to people who don't, who don't know, but you know, businesses have a lot of information 
and they have a lot of contacts and they can use those uh, within their networks to gather up information and uh, produce reports, uh, you know, particularly on things like the impact of a um, extreme event or a drought or a crisis or even COVID on, on their operations and community. So now working with city government, um, the, I think most city resilience frameworks, including the one that we use in the Rockefeller Foundation that was developed by Arab International, um, acknowledges the role of businesses. Um, the, the biggest problem is that um, city governments are more likely to focus on planning frameworks, design, engineering, and infrastructure responses to perceived vulnerabilities in their resilience strategies than the types of issues that immediately concern businesses, which is generally their physical site, uh, materials, equipment, employees, et cetera. Um, and therefore, government-led approaches tend to focus on public-private partnerships, that is, trying to get some funding, uh, large corporations or businesses in collaboration with city, in cities in financing, constructing, and improving physical infrastructure systems. If you go online, I think that's mostly what you will see in terms of, of business uh, collaboration with city governments on urban resilience and things like that. The kinds of things that we've been talking about are rarely ever discussed uh, in city developments, uh, city resilience strategy. Um, but businesses of all scales, uh, and this is down to small SMEs as well, because some of these technology companies, they may have only a few employees uh, producing sensors or uh, mobile apps for farmers. Businesses of all scales have many other products and services to offer. And they also have insights in the causes and responses to disaster and means of addressing it. Um, and my final point here is that um, city officials could benefit from collaborations with business councils and individual business businesses in developing systems and strategies to address crisis. The photos on the right hand side on the top you know, there's an island uh, in the Tubon River near the city of Hoi An, um, where um, some friends of ours have established an um, organic farm. And they collaborated with the city to trial various kinds of grasses and plants to prevent erosion. And so this is kind of a pilot project for an alternative to cement dikes. And now in the bottom image, um, you know, there are these things called geotubes or aqua dams. Um, the companies in Vietnam that are producing them um, used, to, used to make, uh, you know, these big bags for biogas or storage of water until they figured out that they can use these things as kinds of coffer dams. And now they're beginning to sell them in Vietnam um, as a means of protecting critical infrastructure, you know, like hospitals and police stations from flooding. Now, these things, you just um, roll them out um, and then you attach a high, high velocity pump to them and then you can pump in water from a nearby canal or other water source. And then as the, as the water recedes, you just let the water drain out and then roll it back up again. So uh, that's where I'm going to end. And Here's how you can get in touch with the Asia Foundation. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much, Michael, for taking us from, from the theory right down to the practice and the pilot products and technologies that are coming out of Vietnam. Our last speaker tonight is also coming to us from Vietnam. So I am going to turn it over to Lin Nguyen, who is the deputy director of the Mekong a resilient business network, and she has over 20 years of experience supporting small and medium enterprises 
in one of the, the most vulnerable regions in Southeast Asia here in the Mekong Delta. She's also a master trainer for the International Labor Organization and lecturer of Business Edge at the World Bank. So Lynn, I am going to turn it over to you to, to speak to us. Everyone, uh, you just uh, listened to Mike presentations on COVID-19 situation in Vietnam. Um, it's really serious and the supply chains, domestic and international level now. And all of us, uh, we are wor worried about these situations and uh, businesses, they stop and they just focus on how to prevent from COVID-19. Uh, so in my uh, presentation today, I will introduce you about the Mekong Delta Resilient Network. Um, first of all, I, uh, I would like to brief the key information of the Mekong Delta. Uh, Mekong Delta is uh, located in the south of Vietnam including 12 provinces and one municipalities. That's the Gunther city, the center, the center of the Mekong Delta. And uh, in uh, year 2020, Mekong Delta contributed about 80% of rice, 70% of fruit, and 65% of seafood of Vietnam export. And now uh, there are about uh, 61,000 active businesses in the Mekong Delta, and the majority is, is uh, SME. Um, related to question, uh, according to German Watch, Vietnam ranks 13 per 180 most affected economies by climate change. And you and you estimated losses can be up to 10% of uh, Vietnam GDP. And the Mekong Delta is the most serious climate change effect in five economic regions of Vietnam. And um, look at the this picture. You can see this is uh, the right field were affected by droughts and sun water intrusions. And during the last three years, the increase of extreme weather event, such a uh, short water intrusion, uh, subsidence or uh, landslide have become serious and clearly. And let, uh, let's talk about the, the roles of uh, Mekong Delta private sector. As uh, my mentioned is about the the important role of private sector in the Mekong Delta in the Vietnam, not just in the Mekong Delta. Um, businesses uh, plays a significant role in economic development, especially in distribution and export agricultural products in the Mekong Delta. Besides that, they have the real power resources to recover from disaster as well as resilient factors. And um, in practical, we what we uh, what we experience and what we see that the private sector's roles and participations in policy making and implementations in Mekong Delta are remaining weak. And that's one of the reasons the ACI Foundation and VCCI Kungta have established the Mekong Delta Resilient Business Network. Um, Mekong, our network has come in the Mekong Delta at the first time, but we hope that uh, in the next future, we will expand the whole Vietnam and outside Vietnam too. 
and we follow the principles of uh, voluntary self-governing democracy, equality, openness, transparency, and of course, uh, non-profit purpose and Vietnam law compliance. Um, the purpose of our network is um, with five specific targets. First, we try to improve the capacity of businesses to adapt the climate change. Uh, second, we create the business opportunities and create the connections between um, PBB engage, try to engage the businesses to the government in many, many things. And we uh, also try to strengthen SMEs rules in policy formulations, criticism and implementations. And we, uh, during this work, we try to enhance corporate social responsibility related to climate change. And um, that's uh, our expectation in the first period. Uh, we try to collect information and practical lessons on climate change, adaptation, adaptations and resilience for businesses. And we also assess the impact and focus the risk of climate change for the Mekong Delta regions. And based on what we collect and assess, we will uh, we will suggest the policy proposal for the businesses to the government, and we identify and promote businesses opportunity in climate change sector for the network members and businesses, and we also design activity to build a knowledge base for businesses in trout and salinization adoption and to get the targets as our expectations in this year we will do five four activities first we will establish an uh, organizational structure and we also do the research on salinization and trout and we uh, also organize the activities to increase business opportunities through a disaster risk reduction products and service exhibitions. And the last one of this year, we will organize uh, a forum on salinity and trout adoption. Uh, for the first activity, we already finished. Uh, for the second, we are doing, we are collecting the information and assess the impacts of trout and salinity situation in the Mekong Delta. And after we have uh, the information, we will continue design the activities and suggest solution to the local authority. For the third activity, uh, we, we will organize uh, the activities to uh, like exhibition to introduce the technological solution for the businesses. And with the aim, connects businesses and potential customer related to climate change. And the last one is uh, we will organize the forum to introduce or to report our research on salinities and trout adoptions. And of course, we will discuss with uh, our member and businesses to uh, businesses to, to, to adapt, to help businesses adapt the current situations and how to cooperate to overcome the salinity. And the last one we will together to make the policy proposal to the central government and local authorities too. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alina, and thank you to all the speakers. Bar George, did you want to start us off with a question? Yes, please. And I I'm, I realize that we are almost almost uh, closing time. 
So since we are talking of, since we have most of our participants are people who work in cities and in local governments, uh, one of the questions that I think we should pose to you, all of all the speakers, is what would the networks of SMEs, like the ones that you work with, what would you expect? Uh, what would they expect? The SMEs expect from their city governments. So because it would be good if you were able to tell our participants that what are the elements that are most in demand by SMEs from their city governments. Thank you. I mean, any one of you could start off here, depending on whoever is ready. Actually, maybe I can start if it is fine with all of you. Um, Please. So it, it definitely changes from country to country in terms of the like political structure uh, which is put uh, actually in, in 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 turkey the local chambers are very uh, very powerful in terms of having a relationship with uh, local local governments so we are also as salam kobi project we are trying to be a facilitator amongst them as well um, for example in the recent uh, very recent fire uh, disasters that we are having uh, the head of the Union of Chamber of Commerce, our partner, uh, just came to the region, uh, met with the mayor himself, and they declared uh, a, a declaration on how to rebuild the businesses who are affected the fires. So, um, what we see here, uh, like actually our platform is based on that understanding. What we see here is any kind of business organization, and especially if it is registered like here in Turkey, uh, the relationship between the local government is so crucial to have uh, like more uh, faster impact, if you like, because in Turkey, all the registrations and most of the registrations are going through the local government and some of them are going through some central governmental organization. So what we are trying to bring in the picture is to have a very strong connection with the like representatives of the local SMEs and the democratic representatives of the local governments, not only the mayors, but also the city councils. Um, Barbara, let me just jump in here and, and, and briefly um, comment on that one. Uh, I fully agree with everyone. Uh, what I would like to um, add to that point is, um, I think that information is very relevant. And information in cooperation with, let's say, uh, business organizations at the spot. We have seen that in a number of different disasters. We have seen that uh, in earthquake situations in Turkey. We have seen that as well in uh, when we had mudslides after uh, after heavy rainfalls in southern, South America. Um, we had the same thing, or we have the same thing in, in the Philippines, where, where UPS Foundation is working with PDRF. Um, and we know that PDRF is excellent in providing information on where the disaster will strike and what is necessary when the disaster strikes already. And information is necessary to know what, what infrastructure is available from the side of the business. Uh, how can I get help? For instance, uh, when COVID strike, 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 we had the issue with uh, how do we get money? How, how can a business get money when it is not able to, to work, right? And so, um, we made some uh, we made some assessments in in the different networks that we are working in you know uh, connecting the businesses trying to find out who is affected how on one hand and on the other side what needs to be provided immediately uh, what is not necessary just to make sure that we are not providing help that is definitely overloading every every infrastructure it doesn't and it does not lead nowhere right so we probably do not i'll give you one situation we had something on an island in the caribbean and um, they were um, they were um, uh, uh, fridges, refrigerators sent over to to this island. I mean, you know, th this island has no need for refrigerators for the next ten years because so many were brought over. So what I'm saying is, it doesn't make sense. So you need for coordination, you need information, and information is very relevant. And so that needs to be run through these through these networks in cooperation with city government. I pause here and I have to apologize. I need to jump off uh, on another call that is starting in 30 seconds. Thanks a lot for listening and uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the session. Bye. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Um, and 
we we are approaching the time. I, I do want to give a last word uh, to our other speakers to to sign off to Lynn, to Michael, and and to to Berfu, if you'd like to add your final thought quickly on what are small and medium enterprises looking for from city governments. If you could share with us, perhaps in just a minute or so. Uh, yes, uh, based on our experience from the field, uh, I believe there's a lot to do uh, to improve businesses um, resiliency uh, in a holistic way uh, and our most important partners are local authorities uh, and local actors so we look forward to um, carrying on our uh, interventions in close cooperation with all local stakeholders and thank you for uh, sharing the time um, to listen to us today thank uh, you thank you uh Lauren, in one of our, our surveys, maybe about uh, probably about five years ago, um, we found that, you know, a lot of businesses uh, have have CSR programs uh, in which they try to reach out to their communities in times of disasters. But in terms of their re relationship to the government, m most of the time it's the government reaching, uh, I should say, their regulators reaching out to them uh, you know so if you've got a construction company and uh, the department of construction calls you up and says can you please send some trucks to clear the road kind of things and the companies feel obligated to do that uh, because they're afraid if they don't do that then they they will lose a relationship with the regulator now that's kind of the wrong way of doing disaster or crisis management and what what they prefer is being integrated into disaster risk planning so that they know what they can do in the case of a disaster, uh, what the resources are for, for example, you know, how can businesses restock their shelves uh, in order to get food out to the public and uh, things like that. So as, as Hans Peter said, yeah, information one, and it's the sharing and collaboration that becomes extremely important. And Lena, I'll give you the last word before I bring us to a close. Oh, I think we cannot hear you. So I, I think I will bring us to a close then. I just want to thank everyone. I know that this is a very difficult time, both, both in Turkey and in, in Vietnam. Um, and I appreciate everyone making the time to be together. I think we've heard some very clear messages tonight about the role that the private sector and private sector networks can play. Um, as we heard, it's very important to have clear information that's shared about what needs are and to leverage existing structures like chambers of commerce where they are strong um, and to build on those and to build repeatable tools. Um, I think, Michael, also your, your thought is a good one for us to end on, which is it's very important to actually embed these partnerships and these asks and these uh, processes for sharing information before the crisis, right? Not after, and to actually build the partnerships into the planning itself to really work together as long-term partners in a city with business. And so I think that's a very good note for us to end on and, and to take away into further sessions. Um, there are no more sessions of Cities on the Frontline in August. We have a bit of a pause before we start up again in September. So do look out for the next invitation, which will be coming to your inbox in about two weeks time. And with that, I just wanna wish everyone uh, a very safe uh, and healthy next few weeks. Again, thank you so much to all of our speakers uh, for presenting tonight and, and sharing with us. Good night from, from Singapore.